It has been an exciting couple weeks here at Grace Church. If you're just jumping in, we've been walking into a new chapter of vision uh, all through this series, All In, All Out. We've been saying that we want to go all in on our commitment so we can go all out in reaching our community for Christ. And really, the journey that we've been on over the last handful of weeks, I want to catch you up to that. Here's where we started. We began by looking at some needs and opportunities in our community that are real and that God is calling the church to meet. And Pastor Jeff would have walked us through some specific projects, some unique ways that we can be aggressive about meeting those needs and facing those opportunities. And here's the three projects that we walked through. Uh, we looked at sports ministry. We said, boy, could God really reach another generation of people through the sports ministry as we have seen him do that already here at Grace? The second one is developing leaders through 30 and 30. Our vision of launching 30 campuses in 30 years and the leaders necessary to fuel that movement. The third one is the Opioid Recovery Center, where we know that that epidemic has just ravaged our area and we have a real way that we can make an impact right now through this Opioid Recovery Center called Restore and getting that moving. So those are the three projects that, that God has been calling us to that Pastor Jeff walked us through and all along the way, as we've been looking at these needs and opportunities and projects, we've been really walking through 21 days of prayer as an initiative, united together, asking God to move in our hearts and begin to work in our community and to lead us as we go forward. As we looked at moving forward into the vision and kind of the next step, last weekend, Pastor Jeff walked, uh, kind of walked it through with us and said, hey, the, the first step in moving into this vision is gonna be moving forward in generosity. We really have to have that step play out first. And so he, he kind of described for us how God would view us interacting financially. And how this works is this, God calls us to give from the heart as cheerful givers, not under compulsion. And so really th this is less of a financial decision, more of a spiritual one. So God is calling us to interact with Him personally, uh, not really for us to interact organizationally. So that's what we're facilitating, all of us individually, in a united way, interacting with God. And it's exciting that we get to give and be generous in ways that are changing lives and we're seeing people come to know Jesus on a regular basis. So that all culminates this weekend in Commitment Weekend. And here's what Commitment Weekend is all about. This weekend, what we're going to be doing is committing to two things. One of them is praying for your three. Your three are the three people in your life that come to mind who maybe don't have a relationship with Jesus. We want to pray for them by name, daily, that God might work in their hearts and their lives and draw them to Himself. The second thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be pledging financially towards these projects as a decision between us and the Lord. And here's how that's all going to work. If you've been here for the last handful of weeks, you would have got one of these pledge kits. And so if you brought that, great. If you forgot yours or you're just jumping into the conversation, it's right there in front of you in the seats. And you can grab that and a pen and fill that out. And then if you're watching online, click the live stream link or go to allinallout.org and you can make your pledge digitally there as well. If you've been journeying with us through this, hopefully you have prayed together with your family and made this a spiritual decision. Uh, you kind of calculated the total amount that you're looking to be giving, and then you, you projected out how are we going to kind of be faithful to that commitment over the next three years and make a plan to fulfill that, that pledge. These three years at Grace are going to be an amazing time, I believe, that God is calling us into. It all starts this weekend as we go all in and give it our best so that we can go all out in reaching our community for Christ. That's what we want to see happen as we dive into this conversation, and it all begins right now. Well, welcome everybody to Grace this weekend. Welcome everybody at the Montrose Building and everyone watching online and our live sites. Thanks for joining us as well. Uh, we are wrapping up uh, this series called All In, All Out, and uh, if you are our guests this weekend, uh, here in the buildings or online, uh, we are going to have a very different service than normal uh, because the series is different. Uh, we, we've likened this series to a, a family gathering at the kitchen table. And uh, we gather together and we have a, a big dream and a big project 
that we need to tackle. So we've been talking that through, talking about the logistics, talking about the finances of it. And uh, as a guest, what we want is we want to invite you to pull up a stool to the table. We'd love for you to hear what we're doing and see it and be excited about it, but we want nothing from you. And especially this weekend, uh, we're going to be making financial commitments. We are not in any way asking you to do that. And the people who are doing that are kind of doing that in the context of this big conversation. But please uh, pull up a stool and see and hear and be excited about, feel included in those ways. <clears throat> We'd love for you to, to know about that. Uh, through this uh, series, All In, All Out, we've been talking about why, what, and how and uh, why would we open up a chapter of vision? We do this every three years at Grace Church. Uh, why would we do that? Why have we done it in this way? We've gone back to the scripture and said we want Jesus' heart when he looked at his followers and said, uh, look over there to the harvest field. The harvest is ripe. Pray that the Lord will send workers into the harvest field and that Harvest is a metaphor that Jesus uses. The harvest in the Bible there in that metaphor are people who do not yet know about their need for a Savior or who Christ is and the salvation that he offers. And so Jesus is saying, look over there. Those people need what the Bible calls the gospel or the good news that you don't have to be trapped in your sin and your past and your pain but Jesus came to seek and to save and to rescue you from all of that. So he says, that's why we would do that. We would go there. Then we said, what? What are we going to do? What are the, what are the areas that we feel like God is leading Grace Church Bath Campus uniquely? And those are those three projects. It's the sports ministry where we're seeing hundreds of people being reached through sports. In fact, this, this, this week, Eight more kids accepted Christ this week uh, through the, the basketball program alone, right? You clap for that. <clears throat> so that's just, just in the last seven days that happened. Uh, we opened up uh, summer camp registration, and two of the camps filled up within five days. And we've had to put people to waiting lists already. So we're, we're looking at sports and saying there's a unique opportunity there that's kind of unprecedented we believe that God is asking us to act on it. And so we want to do that. 30 and 30 is the high vision of Grace Church to start 30 campuses or church plants in 30 years. The interns and the residents, the infrastructure that needs to happen there is another opportunity that we're always giving ourselves to. And then the third what is the, the 70 bed residential treatment opioid rehab center and partnering with Christ Community Chapel, other churches and ministries in the area, and raising the dollars to build that. So why? Because the harvest is plentiful. What? For us, right now, those three things. And then last week, we talked about the how. And the how is going to be, has to be the generosity of God's people. That to accomplish those things, it's a minimum, a minimum of $6 million. And so we invited you to be a part of that financially. And we learned that when we give, it's never out of guilt. It's never out of shame. It's never out of arm twisting or what the Bible calls compulsion. It's an invitation between you and God if you want to, if you're excited about it, if you feel drawn to it, we want to invite you to give to that. If you don't want to and you don't feel drawn to it, we don't, we don't want you to either, right? So that, that's fine, that's fine. But if you want to, the invitation is there. Now here at Grace, when we tackle these things, we do it in three-year windows. And so that's what we're asking for, just for clarity, for financially. We're asking for a three-year financial pledge if you want to. That pledge is above and beyond your normal giving, right? So all the normal ministries of grace, our missionaries and church plants and urban, we're all of it, it's gonna keep rolling like it normally does. That's where your normal offerings go to. So this is above and beyond. If, you, if you're not giving, we're asking you if you would start, right? 
So we're asking you to do that. We're asking everybody to do that. $6 million is a big lift for the Bath Campus. It truly is. And so we're asking everybody to get their shoulder under that if you're able. In fact, if you're watching online, uh, hundreds of us join the church online every week, and we're asking you to be a part of it too. And so giving through the app and through the website, we're asking you to join in also. And we know that if we all get our shoulder under that, uh, that we know that we can certainly do it. A question that was asked to me several times, I want to make sure that we have clarity on. Many of you were a part of the seed project, which was the last chapter of Grace Church. And you've said, well, what happens with the seed project? So think of it this way. The seed project, the financial commitment to that, ends this weekend, and the commitment to all in, all out starts next weekend. So seed project ends this weekend, all in, all out starts next weekend. Now here's the the fun news about the seed project. All of the goals of that project have been met. And the, the millions of dollars that it took to meet those goals, you have been faithful in giving. So our interns and our residents are here. There's 25 of them studying for full-time ministry to be the pastors, missionaries, directors of the churches we want to plant. The Ellet campus is open, and that was a big goal of the SEED project. The Northeast Atlanta campus that reaches legal immigrants and refugees is open. They, we have about 110 people a week attending. Seven different languages are spoken at that campus, so that has worked. The, the uh, safe house for minor girls rescued from sex trafficking that we gave to through the SEED Project opened last week. And so it's, it's starting to serve those girls. There's already girls that are safe in that house as we speak right now. So those big projects, uh, they're, they're going to continue, of course, but our financial commitment to them it has been met, and thank you for it. And next weekend, we'll launch onto these other projects. And so we do that uh, every three years. Three years from now, I'll be back up here, and we'll have another round of what we believe God is asking us to do as we push forward. The round right now, chapter three, is the sports 30 and 30 and the, the rehab center. So later on in our services, we're going to ask you to, to hand in those commitment cards. And I'll, I'll walk you through that when we get there, but we'll pass the boxes around and, and do that. If you're watching online, you can do that at a live site or you can do that uh, through the websites if you want. But we'll take a moment and do that. That's one thing we're going to do today. The other thing we're going to do today is we're going to do something special with praying for our three. And so the three people that we pray for by name that God would allow us an opportunity to share his hope and love with. And so you have those wood blocks. If you're in the rooms or at the live sites, you have those wood blocks. And <clears throat> we're going to utilize those. And we're going to have a prayer time and do something special with those as well. So that's why the service is so different than it normally is uh, this weekend. As we uh, get into this, I want <clears throat> to talk about this. Excuse me. I want to talk about this, and, and I want to just one last time position us in the scripture of why we give financially and why here at Grace we believe that financial giving is an act of worship. So we do not believe, I want to be crystal clear, we do not believe that if you give $100, you'll get $1,000 back. We don't believe that's a correct teaching of the Bible. Uh, we don't believe that uh, you should give out of shame or guilt or, or out of compulsion. Nobody's going to get rich off your giving. There is no private jet. I have a jet. It, it says Delta on the side of it. I use it all the time, right? And so there's, there's none of that stuff. There's no fancy anything. We would look and say when we give... We give our lives, sometimes in the course of giving our lives, it means our money. And here at Grace, we say that is, that is the Lord's money, and it's to be used for God's purposes, and we've explained what we believe God's asking us to do. 
And when we give money in this circumstance to the Lord, that God does reward it and multiply it spiritually. That he enlarges our harvest of righteousness. That he will do more with our gift than we could ever do on our own. But he does it eternally and spiritually, not with a personal return to the one who gave it. Now, I call that kingdom math, kingdom of heaven math. And I get this idea from Jesus. If if you got your Bibles, open up to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 13, and you look at verse 18, and I'll, I'll show you what we mean by this. We believe that when we give, and we give to the Lord, that God uses it in a special way that he increases the impact of our gift. So here in Luke 13, Jesus is trying to explain kingdom math to his followers. And he he says in, in the context, he says, guys, when you become a follower of me, you're no longer a citizen of the world or a citizen of your culture. You become a citizen of heaven or a citizen of the kingdom of God. And things in the kingdom of God work differently than they do culturally. And they work because God empowers them and uses what we do in a special way. So he's explaining that to his disciples. And verse 18, then Jesus asks, what is the kingdom of God like? So you guys are trying to figure this out. So what is the kingdom of God like? And then he says, now what shall I compare it to? If I was going to teach you about what the kingdom of God is like, how would I teach it to you? And then he comes up with an analogy. And so he says, what's the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It, it's like this. It's like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds perch on its branches. He says, that's what the kingdom of God would like. It's like a mustard seed. If you've never seen one, they're, they're itty-bitty. They're smaller than an apple seed, this little thing and you plant it, and then God grows it, and it grows beyond what you could ever imagine it would be like. This itty-bitty thing about the size of a flea, you plant it, and it grows into this massive tree. And the tree provides shades, and the tree provides nourishment, and it provides rest like the birds could rest on it. He goes, that's what the kingdom of God like. When, When you take something small, and you give it to God, God multiplies it spiritually. I take something little, and in an act of worship and surrender and sacrifice, I, I kind of hand it over to God for his purpose. He empowers it spiritually, and it does more than we could ever ask or imagine. I don't get a personal return. There's a spiritual return and because I only can offer this. It doesn't matter if you are giving God a penny, what the Bible would call a widow's might. It doesn't matter if you're giving a penny or if you're writing the check for $5 million. In light of eternity, it's a mustard seed, Right? It's, it doesn't really, it's, it's not that where the decimal point is and the commas are, it's that you sacrificially say, God, I have this and this is yours. And in an act of love and worship, I, I give it to you cheerfully out of gratitude. It's yours. God looks and says, I love your heart. I, I, don't, I don't care if you're a teenager that is given 100 bucks or, or you're a successful person that's given millions. I love your heart. And what I'm gonna do with your mustard seed is I'm gonna make it into more than you ever imagined that it could be. You know, this is the history even of Grace Church. Uh, Grace Church in, in her in her kind of modern configuration, the, the grace that we would know, the foundations for the modern grace church started to be laid in 1972. The church is older than that, but the foundations for kind of our leg of the journey were laid in 1972 when Pastor Bob and Julie came to grace. 
And when they came to Grace Church, there were about 40 people that, were, that made up the whole of Grace Church. That was like Easter Sunday attendance, right? About 40 people. When Pastor Bob came, he started to cast vision. What could God do? Who could he reach? And they had a, a vision campaign like we're having right now. And those 40 people gave. They offered their lives and they offered their treasure and they they gave, right? Now, how much money can 40 people give in 1972? Not a lot. They didn't have a lot of money. There wasn't a lot of people to raise a lot of money. What they had, ready, was their mustard seeds. Guys, this is what I have, and I, I want you to have it. And I give it to you. I want you to use it. It's not much. It's just what I got. It's all yours. Now, God took that and multiplied it. So here's the, here's the math. From 1972 to 1992, Grace Church grew by over 1,000%. And the foundations for the modern presentation of grace were laid. 1,000% growth from some money that some people had. I think the big goal was to help the roof, not the leak. But faithful people giving to the Lord, God receiving their gifts and doing kingdom math on it. Now, in 1993... The present presentation of Grace Church, the Grace Church that you and I would kind of know and understand, that started in 1993. And in 1993, the people who had come to Grace in the previous 20 years had a vision campaign. And their big goal in that vision campaign was to raise extra money to hire a youth pastor. And so they came up with what I'll call a partial salary for a youth pastor and, and they committed it for a three-year window. And Pastor Bob went looking for a youth pastor. And he interviewed all these amazing people. And none of them took the job. And so he wound up with me, right? And so Heidi and I, he came for Heidi and I. And he looked at us and he said, we have a partial salary. It wasn't much. In fact, that's why Heidi and I own businesses. We, we started those so we could stay here. <laughs> but in 1993, it's what we had. And he came to us, and he said, guys, I got three years of this. And if you want to be a part of this, this movement of Grace Church, and you can figure out a way to live on this, you can come do it. <clears throat> and if God blesses, you can stay. If he doesn't, the money runs out in three years. And so we felt called we wanted to be a part of what God was doing. So we said yes, and we, we knew the gig, right? That when the money's gone, it's gone, but we wanted to see what God would do. Now, 450, 500 people in 1993 did that, mustard seeds. That's, that's all that there was. There was no mega person anywhere. Just a bunch of folks being faithful, Gave their mustard seed. Now, look what happened. From 72 to 92, over 1,000% growth. From 92 to 2018, over 1,000% growth. God, <clears throat> ain't clap for that, okay? God is just blessing what he's done. Now, there's a business principle. It says this. The best indicator of future performance is past performance. So when I pray about the growth of grace, all I ask God for is 1,000% growth. And it's not a loopy prayer. There's two cycles where he has done just that. So I just ask the Lord, Lord, here's our mustard seeds. Would you just do that again? You don't even have to outperform yourself. Just do it again. And if God would simply do what he did from 72 to 92 and from 92 to 2018, 
if he would just simply do it again, there'd be 55, 60,000 people a week that would be tied to grace, that would be under the teaching of God's word, that would be motivated to reach their friends, their loved one, and serve their community. See? Now, we would do that through our campusing systems. We're not going to build a stadium. We would do that through 30 and 30. But all God has to do is repeat himself. And through that story and through that process, I want you to see the constant the constant is not the pastors, they've changed. The constant is not the programs, that's all changed. The constant is not the strategies, that's all changed. The constant is not even the people. The people have all changed. Many of them are with the Lord, right? So the people have all changed. The constant is the act of worship. Every time. God has looked at his people and said, will you trust me and give your mustard seed? The people of Grace Church have said yes. And again, and again, and again, and again. And here we are today, and I'm gonna be back here again, and again, and again, and again. You and I are not going to reach tens of thousands of people using sports. I can't do that. You can't do that. But God can take our mustard seed and he can do that. I'm not going to solve the opioid crisis and neither are you. But God can take our mustard seed and he can do that. I'm not going to plant 30 churches. Neither are you. But God can take our mustard seed and he can raise up a generation of workers. He can do that, see. When we give, we don't come in as heroes. We come in with humility and we give sacrificially. We're the comma lands at lands. And we offer what we have. And then God, see, God does kingdom math on that because it was given to him. So when we give, that's what we're doing. We're just surrendering to God. Here's what I got. And I love you, Jesus, and I want to love my neighbor as myself, and here's what I got. And God loves the cheerful giver. It's not a tax, it's not a manipulation, it's not enriching anybody. It's just, here, Lord, it's, a, it's an offering. It's an act of worship to you. And then what we're saying is, God, would you take these gifts, would you do the mustard seed math on them, and would you use them to rescue people would you help people to know your soul? My, my heart so resonates with the prayer in Psalms 82. The psalmist is, is praying to God. And as we've been approaching this whole endeavor, this has been our prayer to God. God, would you do this? The psalmist says this, verse three, chapter 82, Psalms. Lord, would you defend the weak and the fatherless? God, would you do that with our mustard seed? And God, we, we, your people, we're the body of Christ, we're, their, we're your ambassadors, as if you yourself were making your appeal. Use us. But God, would you use us to be a father to the fatherless? You can call me coach if you want, but I'll step in the void. God, if you will create it, will you defend the weak and the fatherless? God, would you uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed? God, there are people, the poor and the oppressed, the, the, the hungry kids, the women being trafficked in sex, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the addicts, the, the, the single parent, the people who are poor and oppressed, they're out of sight and they're out of mind, and everybody's given up on them. They're on the other side of the world, 
They, they, all the assumptions are made. They're down at the club stripping. They, they, they're, they're poor and they're oppressed. God, would you uphold their cause? People don't care about their cause, but we will. We will take it up. Even though it's not ours, we, we'll, we'll take it up. God, would you use us that way? We, I, we got a mustard seed. We got, a, we got a soccer ball. That's what we got. But would you use it in that way? Would you rescue the weak and the needy and deliver them from the hand of the wicked? God, these dear people that are addicted to opioids, you love them. And they made bad decisions and they're responsible and nobody's arguing that, but you rescued them. You want them to know your love. You love them. I've made bad decisions. I'm responsible for my sin. I'm responsible for my immorality. I'm responsible for my selfishness. I stand dead in my trespasses and sins against you. Me, I do. I stand as an enemy of God in my heart and you rescued me. You didn't forget about me. You didn't tell me to lay in the bed that I made. You came for me. God, would you do that? And I wanna do that. I wanna be used by you. And I got a mustard seed, but you can have it. See? You can have it. And whatever the means are, sports, school, <laughs> rehab, whatever they are, if you'll, if you'll take what I can give and do that math on it, I, I want you to have it. In fact, I'm eager to give it, see? So that's what we're doing. That, that's why this is worship, right? There's no personal return on this. That's, that's not giving something to God, that's giving something to yourself. But looking and saying, Lord, spiritually, eternally, a harvest of righteousness. Our gifts are going to go toward the sports ministry, 30 and 30, the rehab unit. We do not think that every church should do what we're doing. The elders and I believe that these are the unique doors that God has opened for us right now. No compulsion, no pressure, no obligation. If you want to, you're invited in. And we believe that when we do respond that way, that God will receive that act of worship and will use it in powerful ways, okay? So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a moment and be silent. If you're watching online, I encourage you and your groups to be silent for a moment of prayer. If you're by yourself on your phone or computer, just you and, your, and the Lord, and be silent. I, I want you to pray over your commitment that God would just use it, right? That he would just use it. And in a moment, I'll pray, and then we will, we will pass the boxes, and we will collect those. If you're watching online, you can make your pledges online. And if all that equals $6 million, then we're going to press go on all these things we talked about. They're teed up and ready to roll. But we're giving this to God, okay, and asking him to, to bring a spiritual return, on that investment. All right, so why don't we pray for a moment. Let's just be still for a minute. And why don't you pray and talk to the Lord, and then I'll pray out loud, okay?
Hi, I'm Brett Halati, and I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a husband, and I'm a ministry leader here at uh, Grace Church for Celebrate Recovery. From 2006 to 2015, I was addicted to opiates, and it was a very dark and deep path that I went down. It started off being fun, but ended in misery. I had overdosed three times and was close to death. I wanted to give up. I was hopeless, scared, and I tried to quit over and over again, and I just could not quit. I couldn't even get 24 hours. Uh, I finally hit my rock bottom, at least what I believe was my rock bottom, in a moment of desperation, um, and I went to God for help. And me and my relationship with God at the time, it was just a flicker. It was just, it was just there a little bit, but I went to Him and I said, God, please help me and he performed a miracle. I haven't picked up a drug or a drink since that day. But what he did was he gave me the courage to, to get honest with myself, with him, and with the people around me to let them know what was really going on. And the second thing he did was give me the strength to, to really ask others for help um, because I had tried over and over to do it myself in many different ways. And, and had zero success with that option. I needed other people, I needed other believers, people that would pray for me, pray with me, uh, give me encouragement. I, what I really needed was a community. I needed a team to carry me at times, to get me through uh, one day at a time. I learned I had to surrender to Him on a daily basis because my strength wasn't good enough. And there was resources all around for me to use, and I had to be willing to go to them and to use those. And I say all that to say this, that, that there is hope. And when you're in addiction, there seems like there is zero hope, but there is hope. And for me, Christ was the answer. He's the one that got me sober, um, but it was his children that taught me how to live life uh, sober. I like to say that I, know, I didn't really have a, a drug problem. I didn't really have a drinking problem, but what I had was, it was a sober problem. I had a problem living life sober. Uh, dealing with my emotions, dealing with people, dealing with circumstances not going my way. I had to have men show me how to do that. And when I had questions, people to call to get me through. Uh, lastly, uh, if I can do it, really if, if, if he can do it for me, then he can do it for anyone. Now we believe that, right? If we believe that Christ is who he says he is, then we believe what Brett just said. That there is no one hopeless. That God can transform a heart, he can renew a mind, he can break an addiction, he can heal a marriage, he can bring you through the pain of your past, he can cause you to love your dad again. We believe that, right? That that's who Jesus is. And that is the, the good news. Not that there's a force or a system, but there is a God who is greater than anything in our lives who defeated sin, who overcame death. The Apostle Paul affirms this. He says in Romans chapter 10, it's one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. Romans chapter 10, he says this in verse 13. He says, for everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Everybody. Everybody who, who recognizes their spiritual condition, that we are dead in our sins and trespasses, that there, there is no other hope ultimately in life. Everybody who sees that, everybody who sees and confesses that Jesus is Lord, he's God, that he's the way and the truth and the life and that there is no other. And everyone who calls on his name will be saved. We believe that. We believe that that's the hope and the truth and and the help that we found and that we needed and that that is ultimately the hope for our hurting and dying world. And Paul makes that great 
proclamation, declaration, and then he asks some questions. And they're logical and they're convicting. He, he says this, verse 14, how then can they call on one of whom they do not believe? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. Paul just asks a very logical question. He says, if anybody, anybody who calls the name of the Lord will be saved, but how can they call on somebody they never heard about? All these kids, the majority of our culture that has no contact with the church, how can they hear? They're not going to run into the name of the Lord on the internet. They're not going to hear about Jesus on television. They're not going to, he's not going to come over their radio station one day. He's not going to show up in their Spotify account. How can they believe in one that they don't know about? If they would show up and play basketball with us, maybe we could tell them. How are they going to know unless there's churches and pastors and leaders that can teach them? How are they going to, where are you going to run into the gospel in the midst of your addictions if there's not people there, salt and light? Not people that would be willing to walk through life with you. See? How beautiful, it's beautiful, the feet of those who bring the good news. See? Here at Grace, that's what we do when we talk about praying for our three. Three people that we pray for by name. When we talk about praying for our three we're not talking about three cold calls that we're going to call up and try to sell you something. Just my friends, my, my kids, my family, my coworkers, my teammates, people I love. I pray for you by name every day that God will give us what we call a no-brainer moment. I'm not pressuring you. I'm not being weird in our relationship. I'm just asking God to work in your life so that one day you'll ask me some version of this question. Hey, could you give me the reason for the hope that's within you? Brett, how did you get sober? How did your guys' marriage turn around? How come you're not so mad at your dad the way that you used to be? How, how, how did... How did you have peace when you lost your job? What, what is the deal with you? Could you just, could you tell me the deal with you? So I'm praying that God would work in somebody's heart like that. They ask the question. I'm not being obnoxious with them. They ask the question. And then I just ask God for the courage and the clarity to share my own story. Here's my deal. This is what worked for me, man. We have two goals in the next three years, two big ones. One is to give $6 million minimum to accomplish all these things we've been talking about the last month. The second is this prayer goal. We're asking God to allow a minimum of 1,000 people to accept him as their savior. God, would you answer the prayers that we have for our three? We're gonna be praying for thousands of people every day by name collectively. And God, as we pray collectively, I will individually, I, would you allow me to have beautiful feet? To, to answer a question to a person that I love. And then collectively, we're asking God as a church, God, would you allow a thousand people to know you, to receive you, to be discipled, and to, be, to, to discover the hope that we've discovered. 
So we want to remind each other of this, and this is why we handed out these, these wood blocks. If you've got yours, grab it real quick. And we're going to do that here in the, in, in the Gent Road building and the Montrose building. And what we're going to do is this. We want you to take that wood block and we want you to turn it over. There's like a stained side and then like a naked side. We want you to turn it over and we want you to write down the names, the first name of the three people that you're going to pray for. And if you don't have those names already, in a minute, I'm going to give you time. I want you to ask God for them. God, who would you have me? And just have them like kind of burn them in your mind and in your heart a little bit, okay? And then we're going to write those names down individually. And then what we're going to do is we're going to turn that over and we're going to create an art piece at Gent Road and at the Montrose building. The names are going to be glued against the wall. So their names are never going to be seen, but we're all going to know that they're there. And as each of these blocks turns into a piece of art that hangs in the lobbies, When we come in to services or in for special events and we see those blocks against that wall, it's going to remind us that there are thousands, thousands of individuals who need to know about Christ. And we're asking, they don't even know that we're asking God for them. But we're just asking God, God, I'll tell them. If you give me the opportunity, I'll tell them. But collectively, there will be thousands and thousands of people every day. And you might live with them and you might work with them and you might work out with them. And when you see them, you pray, God, would you work in their life the way that you worked in mine? So we'll write their names down. We'll turn that over. And then what we're going to do is this, is I'll give you in a minute, I'll give you an opportunity. We want you to go to these boards that are around the auditoriums. They're either probably beside you or behind you. And you'll see there already, there's thousands of these up from, from this weekend. And we want you to join yours with them. And we'll take that and we'll turn it into a piece of art and you'll see it out in the lobby. And you'll know what it is. And we'll pray together that God will will use our prayer, our offering in this way, okay? All right. Begin to pray, why don't you, and and write your names down. And in a minute, I'll I'll pray and kind of close that time. And then we'll, we'll start moving and we'll put that up and then come back to your seat and we'll finish our service up, okay? Let's take a minute and write our names down. Ask God for those names and begin to pray for them. Jesus, we offer these. Remind us, prompt us, Holy Spirit. Help us to be faithful and diligent. And God, would you just create an opportunity, a natural one, one that is gentle and respectful, to simply share with people that we love the love that we found in you. As we collectively do that as a church, God, and it's thousands upon thousands of names, would you give us this prayer of a thousand people knowing you, God? Minimum. (laughs) You want to quadruple that, that'd be awesome. But minimum, God, would you work in that way? 
So we do this again, God, as a response to your goodness to us. Thank you, Jesus.